Hello, everyone. Rest of Aquarimax Pets here with my Daphnia cam. As you can see, this is my 20-gallon Daphnia culture. You can see some snails. These are ram's horn snails um, crawling on the glass here in front. Uh, and I keep them in with the Daphnia for several reasons. You can see that it is a thriving colony. And I'm uh, excited to talk to you a little bit about that today and answer any questions you might have about these lovely aquatic crustaceans. I see that Frank DeTank, Wendy Hickson, Dope Critters, East Coast Isopods, Laura Taylor, Kriegs are all here already. Awesome. So Frank is letting me know that we have the thumbs up on the audio and on the video. Excellent. Great. Thank you for letting me know, Frank. I know I can count on you. Therapod Hunter is here as well. Welcome. All right. So first of all, Oh, I see that we've got Zero Cool, Christine Carignan, and Mr. and Mrs. Morelia as well. So welcome all. Welcome one and all. I would like to... Oh, I see Mantis God is here as well. That's coming in a little bit uh, pixelated. I think that's just the um, fact that it is not a live... I mean, it is a live feed. It's not uh, a land connection. It's just an internet connection. That's too bad. I think I'm going to exit the solo layout for now, but uh, hopefully we'll be able to get some better shots of that. I do have it at uh, high def and whatnot, and this is just a small part of the tank. Uh, I have the, my camera constraints are such that I can only do it that way. It's actually quite close to me. I can reach down and touch this tank right now that I'm filming, but not the part that I am filming. I see that RI Naturalist is here, and Therapod Hunter, my Spanish rib newt. Ooh, let's talk about the Spanish rib newt. Oh, hello, Sean Meister. Spanish rib newt obliterates Daphnia within two days. I don't know how he consumes them all in such a small amount of time. Well, they're a little bit like potato chips that way. They're, uh, there's a lot, a bit of crunch to them. And um, once you, uh, you know, crush them all up, I don't know that newts exactly chew, but <laughs> once they crush them all up, there's not all that much left. There's a lot of water to them, too. So they are nutritious in, in the sense that they're very healthy for a lot of aquatic organisms to eat. They're great for conditioning fish, great for aquatic amphibians, as you're demonstrating with your Spanish rib newt. Um, but in terms of mass, there really isn't a lot to them besides the water that's in them. But they do have a lot of good uh, nutrients in them once you consider that most of what's there is water. Uh, and they are, you can gut load them pretty effectively uh, with certain things. and it's really, really good for conditioning uh, fish. When I, I bred bettas, I condition them with, with Daphnia. Other fish condition them with Daphnia. They are pretty fantastic. So great little creatures for a lot of things. Let's see if I can get them. Oh, no, now it's coming out even even more pixelated. No fun. I, um, they probably, well, I know they do have some calcium in them, Therapod Hunter. Um, being crustaceans with their shells, their their chitinous um, exoskeletons, but they do have some calcium in there for sure. And thank you, Mantis God. Yes, the more of you uh, like the stream, the more people find out that the stream is going and more people we get here. So on Patreon, I didn't actually have any questions. I had some enthusiasm for the uh, Daphnia day, but I didn't have any questions show up on that. So um, here is a question from Chet, Chet Kanzi. My last Daphnia culture had clear worms that kept eating the eggs and crashed. Is there a way to get rid of them without starting over? Mm, good question. So here, here's a question, a couple of questions I have. Um, Daphnia, when, when things are going well, Daphnia tend to give live birth and then they only lay uh, their resting eggs, or epipia, which means saddle, basically. They're these roughly saddle-shaped structures that are uh, eggs resistant to drying, resistant to heat, resistant to cold, that kind of stuff. And they only produce those generally when their conditions are fairly poor. When conditions are good, they're giving birth. So when you say clear worms that kept eating the eggs, um, were you witnessing them eating the resting eggs? Because if you were, it might have been something else that caused the crash because the fact that there are resting eggs in the culture indicates there might be an environmental factor that's causing them to go into resting phase. Um, if you were seeing them like 
attack the uh, adult females and remove the eggs from inside them. That's, that's something else. So let me know a little bit more about that. Oh, it's the iridescent unicorn again. Great. Welcome. Um, Eastern, East Coast isopods, my Daphne culture I tried a while ago, failed very quickly. Don't know why. There are actually a lot of reasons why Daphne cultures can fail very quickly. Um, one of them is water quality. Uh, and by that, I don't mean that you created terrible conditions for your Daphne by uh, negligence or anything like that. What I'm saying is um, Daphne can be very, very sensitive indeed to uh, water, the type of water you use. Uh, if you use tap water that has been dechlorinated, many strains of Daphnia cannot tolerate that. Uh, it, the best way sometimes to get them to, to uh, survive is to use uh, mature tank water. You have to make sure it's hydro free because if they're hydro in there, the hydro proliferate and kill off your Daphnia culture. But if you can ensure that the water is hydro free, that uh, tank water can be an excellent source of water for your Daphnia. Uh, Overfeeding and underfeeding are tricky, and I hope to address both of those uh, more in detail in this stream. And the types of food you use can also make a big difference. So tell me a little bit about what your setup was, East Coast Isopod, uh, how you set it up, what foods you were using, what kind of water you were using, that kind of thing. Maybe I can help you out. This particular strain of Daphne is actually really tough. I use water that I dechlorinate, and I put it in. I don't even let it sit uh, after I dechlorinate it. What I do is I fill up a jug of water because I usually do this is a 20 gallon tank. Can't really tell because I can't focus on the entire thing at once very easily. Uh, 20 gallon long tank. I put, uh, when I do water changes, typically a two gallon water change at once. I do that once or twice a week. I fill the gallon jug three quarters of the way with cold tap water, put in a couple of drops of prime fill it up the rest of the way so it mixes fairly well and dump it in. That's what I do. And it works well with this colony, as you can see. I see that uh, 503 is here. That is excellent. Welcome, 503. Always great to see you here. And let's see. So chat says it was a new culture with eggs from online, but they attacked the adults as well. Okay, so that's good to know. I used aged tank water, so I restarted with tap water, and they seem to be doing fine so far. Okay, good. So got rid of the worms, or they just disappeared, or you got rid of them, or how does that work? Oh, we're up to 30 people. Awesome. I can't tell how many likes we have because I'm on StreamYard, so that I could do the Daphnia cam today, as you see. Um, so I don't know what's going on there, but if you haven't liked the stream, please do it, and we'll get a we'll get a like spike going, and that's always good for the uh, getting more people in to the stream. But I appreciate everybody who's here so far. So let's talk a little bit about what you see in the picture and what's going on here. This white uh, thing down at the bottom right of the Daphnia cam. I don't know if it'll let me do solo layout. Uh, too fuzzy right now. Too bad. The camera's not actually fuzzy. It's the it's the bandwidth issue. Um, so this is a uh, PVC elbow. You can probably see that. The nice thing about PVC elbow is it's a little bit uh, more dense than water. So it sinks and I have a flexible air stone and I drilled a hole in this PVC elbow and just stuck the airline through it. And so that creates a weighted area for the air stone to be able to bubble up. I keep this on the far right side of the tank, as you can probably see here in the picture, um, the far right side of the tank some coarse bubbles. I don't like to use fine bubbles. Can fine bubbles can get trapped inside the Daphnia skeletons and it causes them to be trapped at the surface and then they will die after that. But coarse bubbles like this are not uh, a problem. They don't stress out the Daphnia. And if they want to go to a place where there's uh, less water uh, movement, they can, but they tend to spend most of their time on this side of the tank. Under the light, I have a light that covers about half the tank and that's what you're seeing right now. So, Oh, 503, you're going to get your monos to reproduce. That's awesome. I have uh, kept a monos before and I've had females with eggs. It's a pretty tricky business from what I understand because you have to uh, change the salinity of the water for the zoe eh, or the um, shrimp larvae, in, in essence, uh, for their larval planktonic stage. I have raised shrimp with uh, larval planktonic stages. I've worked with Opaiulam for 
since about 2004, and I breed those, and they have a, a larval planktonic stage, but they're always in the same salinity, so it's a little bit easier. Um, and then I have had uh, ghost shrimp. I have bred ghost shrimp that have a planktonic stage as well, uh, but they can stay in freshwater. So um, I'm interested in hearing more about what you're doing there with those. Okay. So, oh, Sean used to raise Daphne and feed them to your angelfish fry. That's awesome. I uh, I did too. When I was about 13, I started out with uh, Daphne. I collected my first group of Daphne in a pond not far from my uh, house at the time. And I think I was collecting all sorts of stuff from the pond and moved it into several jars and tanks and whatever. And a few days later, saw that there were Daphne zipping around. And so I started breeding them, kept that strain going for years and was feeding various fish with that. It was a strain that's, they were, the individuals are slightly smaller than this strain, but they, it was a great hardy strain. Loved them. They were great. So he's coast. So he used distilled water in a six quart tub. I would say distilled water is usually not the best with Daphnia. It's okay for hatching the eggs, but within a short time after that, they will need uh, more minerals in their water and distilled water will actually kill them off. People often uh, recommend that, but I've never found that to be a good thing with Daphnia long-term. And glad you're loving it, Mr. and Mrs. Morelia. I just wish I could get a better bandwidth so I could I could do solo layout when it would actually, you could actually see what's going on as soon as I do that, it's not working. I wonder, I could experiment a little bit with the uh, depth of field and whatnot, see what I can get, but let's see. Moved it back just a little bit. And what does that do? Does that do anything? Nope. Bandwidth's still kind of crummy. So anyway, glad you're enjoying it, though. I'm going to move it a little bit closer so you can see the Daphne a little bit better. And oh, yeah, Frank to tank. Spring water can work. And, but yeah, like you say, age cycle water is definitely the best. And I found that the frequent small water changes is doing about 10 to 20% on this with the uh, freshly dechlorinated water, dechlorinated with prime, works great for me for this strain. Um, there are strains that are not nearly as resilient as this one. And close your forte. Hello. Good evening to you. Well, 503, picturing my teenage, uh, my room in my teenage years being full of cages and jars and random bins of animals. Yes, you got it. Um, I, in fact, had, there was a bunk bed there. My brother and I shared uh, a bunk bed and I persuaded him to remove the bunk bed and we would uh, sleep on sleeping bags so I could uh, put some tables in there to uh, keep animals on. I had, uh, uh, I think in the place of our bed, there were several things. But one of them was uh, my rodents. I, I bred hamsters, and we had a gerbil, we had a rat, things like that. And um, I think there were some goldfish in the spot where our bed used to be. And we actually took out, we had a fairly large closet, the kind of closet that goes all along one wall. Took out the closet, well, all the closety things that one keeps in a closet, and put in animals. I actually used plastic sheeting to wall off half of the closet, which was probably about the size of a refrigerator, this half of the closet. Um, like a, a refrigerator lying down. And um, I made a kind of a vivarium in there and put a snake in there and stuff. And I'd, I had a turtle I would put in there. <laughs> it was, yeah, that's that's exactly right on the nose. Okay. And Chet restarted with his Daphnia. Or, okay. And from scratch in a new, two, two, a new gallon jar with fresh eggs about two weeks ago. So far, I haven't seen any worms. Just was curious, wrench to similar problem in case they showed up again. I'm trying to figure out if you had detritus worms or darrow worms, or if there's something else going on. Um, planaria, there, there are a few options that it could be. If you happen to have any video clips of what was actually attacking your Daphnia, I might be able to help you a little bit more. Um, there are a lot of worm-like things that could potentially be the issue. So um, it sounds like you're doing well so far, but if uh, I haven't had a similar problem, but if I were to see some video of these uh, little worm creatures, maybe I could give you some more insights. So um, the original Daphnia that I got when I was a kid, I collected from a pond. These Daphnia here were actually sold to me as Russian red Daphnia. And 
Um, let me do a little bit of uh, checking really quick on the timeline here. Um, about when I got them. I'm, I'm gonna look it up online and see if there is, okay, um, about 10 years ago, over 10 years ago, I put, put one of my first um, YouTube videos up. It wasn't my first, but it was one of my first uh, YouTube videos. How, it's called How to Cult Culture Daphne Outside, um, 19th of May, 2012. And at that time I had been culturing this very strain of Daphne outside for probably a couple of years, I wanna say, um, in a bucket. So I've had this strain of Daphnia for a very, very long time, but it was sold to me as Russian red Daphnia by, uh, I think the, the place is called Tropic Isle. I'm not sure if they're still around anymore. Uh, I think it was called Tropic Isle, not too far away from me, about an hour-ish away from where I am now, maybe a little less than that. And uh, I've had this strain of Daphnia going ever since. There was a point when I moved about seven plus years ago when um, the culture crashed when I moved, I guess it was all the environmental changes and the difficulties of moving, um, crashed, but then I was able to use some resting eggs to um, get it to come back. And besides that little blip, when I first uh, moved to this place where I am now, I've had the colony going the entire time, at least one of them. Um, often have more than one going, it's usually best to do that. So yeah, good question. Oh, I know what you mean. Scooping up large amounts of Daphnia is very satisfying. You just imagine how happy your fish are going to be. Um, it's kind of funny because, <coughs> excuse me. Oh, sorry about that. This this strain of Daphnia is actually uh, a little too big to feed to my endlers, the, the adults at least. And my goldfish will eat them, and I do give them to my goldfish, but I don't have a ton that eats them right now. Be um, really excitedly. I mean, they're not the perfect size. My dad, my goldfish, like I said, will eat them and I can feed the baby ones to my handlers, but um, I kind of wish I had other fish like angelfish or something that would really go after these even more uh, excitedly. And Biodan, welcome. Good to see you here. And oh, okay, Sean. Yeah, there have been times when I was mostly in the aquarium hobby and that was mostly because I was forced to when I lived in Hawaii, our apartment complex rules were such that we could we could have fish and we could have birds. So we had fish and we had a bird. There you go. And but other than that, I've uh, pretty much been more of a an all purpose, uh, you know, in wide interests in how, the, how this works, uh, all aspects of the animal keeping hobby. Derek, welcome. And there is what did I just see? Beverly, hello from Arkansas. Hello and welcome. Well, there you go, Sean. Gerbils. Gerbils works. I really like gerbils, actually. I had one uh, back in the day before I knew you are supposed to have more than one together, but that was many years ago. So, calls well that ends well. Any idea what would be an effective non-vertebrate predator for scuds in a small setup? What else are you keeping in your scud setup? Uh, in this setup? What other creatures are there? I'm, I'm assuming things like shrimp, partly from your avatar there. You might be keeping shrimp there. Is that true? Because that's going to um, considerably narrow the scope of possible predators. So just let me know a little bit more about your setup. Yeah, I, I know what you mean, Mantis God. Um, I have a closet right now that is very much in the same vein. Um, my closet in my critter room is essentially all isopods. I think there are a couple of millipedes in there, but uh, yeah, it's one of those big closets that goes along basically the entire wall of the room, two sides to it, and uh, it's filled with shelves and filled with isopods. And then I also have isopods in other places, but that's that's my basic isopod spot. Thank you, Biodan. And I actually want to do something in a minute here. I want to feed the colony because I've noticed some interesting phenomena when I feed it. Uh, how they react to the food. So, planaria are super cool. I mean, when they're in a place you don't want them, they can be frustrating, but they're super cool by themselves.
<laughs> you brought home a southern bobcat cub. Wow. Yeah, that sounds familiar to me, although I never actually brought home a bobcat. But I did bring home things that uh, made my parents a bit uh, upset, though. Hmm, McGee, any more freshwater crustaceans you keep besides Daphnia? Yeah, yeah, I raise amphipods, um, Hyalella Azteca, the also known as um, scuds. Mm. Scuds are, are amphipods. I, I culture those as well. Um, currently, I do have copepods in that culture with the scuds. And currently, I think those are the other, only other freshwater crustacean. No, they're not. No, they're not. I, I, I have to remember. Um, I also have neocaridina shrimp, some blue dream shrimp. And uh, then this doesn't really count as freshwater, but I have opaiula, brackish water shrimp as well. So um, I think those are the only ones I keep now. Uh, there are many others that I have kept. Um, so, ooh, first class fish. Excellent. Yeah, any questions you have about the Daphne, let me know. I'm trying to make sure I answer any Daphne questions anybody has. Okay, so you have three gallon bowls. Um, yeah, I was thinking that might be an opaula. Calls well that ends well. Looks a lot. Uh, yeah, yeah, it looks like an opaula. That's true. Um, so three gallon bowl, and you have snails in one. You have another three gallon bowl with no snails. I'm trying to think of a non vertebrate predator for scuds. To be honest, nothing's really coming to mind that's non vertebrate. Plenty of fish you could put in there that would that would help handle those scuds. But anything that you could put in there that's a non-vertebrate that might eat the scuds might also go after the shrimp is what I'm thinking. And, and of course, many of the vertebrate predators that you would put in there would also go after the, or the snails. Sorry. Um, would go anything you put in there might go after the snails. Um, whether it's a vertebrate or invertebrate, if it's going to go after the scuds, they might. You don't always know, but um, could happen. So, yeah, I can't think of a whole lot else. I wish I could. Okay, whatever. Best tips for avoiding crashes in a 10-gallon colony. Okay, well, the first thing that came to my mind was two things. Okay, first thing, make sure you have two 10-gallon colonies. Even better, make sure you have two bigger colonies, 20-gallon, 30-gallon, uh, whatever, bigger than that, if you can. Um, redundancy, positive redundancy is super important with Daphnia uh, because they can crash. Um, frequent water changes, very important. Um, I, like I said, I do frequent partial water changes on this tank once, one time to two times a week. Uh, I think the initial setup is some of the hardest part of the uh, culturing. It's really difficult to make sure that you're not feeding too much, but that you are feeding enough when the colony first starts. In this particular colony, I started just maybe a couple months ago. Uh, I took two Daphnia, just two. And Daphnia generally reproduce through parthenogenesis where they're doing well. So I took these two Daphnia, put them in a, a gallon jar, let them reproduce for a week or two. So there were, you know, somewhere between 25 and 50 Daphnia in there maybe. And then I put them into this tank. The tank had already been set up. The tank had been running in there with uh, some snails in there for a while to kind of, uh, you know, get the tank cycled to some extent get some um, microbial, uh, you know, microorganisms, especially infusory in the water, which is really good for Daphnia. Oh, did I? Did that just die there? What's going on? Okay. Looks like we're doing a little bit better, but my Daphnia are frozen. I'm going to take them out of the stream, maybe, and then add them back in. Let's see if that helps. Eh, still kind of crummy. Um, Anyways, I was saying you want to keep um, some infusoria in there is good for the Daphnia and, and the microbial population for uh, for nitrifying bacteria. However, Daphnia are actually quite resistant to things like ammonia. can do a lot better than many fish can with ammonia going on. Um, so I had the snail population going on as well, small number of snails in there just to kind of get the water going and everything. And then uh, added those Daphnia. And I didn't feed the Daphnia directly for a while. I was just feeding fish food, um, algae wafers, um, Aquion algae rounds are actually really good for this. Feeding those to the snails. The snails would eat those. As they eat them, 
they're doing two things. One, they're producing waste that infusoria are feeding on, and two, they're kind of the little bits get kind of particulated and, and get up in the water a little bit, and the Daphne eat that. So they do really well on that, and I didn't feed them the, the Daphne anything else for a while until the colony got bigger. And now that it's this big, now I don't necessarily recommend feeding uh, yeast to Daphnia for beginners. I recommend like a powdered uh, diet that's half spirulina and half, you could use uh, whole wheat flour, you could use whole brown rice flour, you could use chickpea flour, you can mix all of those, something like that. Mix that with water and put it in with an eyedropper. I, I like to use that, it's great. But I also use yeast, but I find that a lot of people make mistakes with yeast. One thing is people use the wrong type of yeast. It's just the active baker's yeast that you use to make bread. Mix it with water and pour a small amount. Sorry, this phone is always right here, and I, I forget that it's going to be there. Um, and I, I can't mute it. How do you mute it? I always forget. Sorry. Maybe it's this. Okay, try that. Anyway, uh, you put the yeast in. Um, after it has sat in water, you want to get it very, very uh, suspended in the water, not any particles left, really, uh, that are big enough to sink to the bottom. You want it suspension. And you add that. You don't want to add too much. You don't want to add too little. You want to make the water, water somewhat cloudy, but not too cloudy. And the, the Daphne will eat that. Uh, and as long as you're frequently, you know, keep doing the water changes, partial water changes with water that's appropriate for Daphne, and you are feeding them enough, but not too much. They usually do really, really well. Hmm. Okay, so uh, Chet, to share the videos about the little worm creatures, uh, you can contact me through Instagram is probably the best way, or, or uh, Facebook. Just go to Aquarimax Pets on either one of those, and uh, you can do that. So BioDan. Needlefish and bumblebee gobies coming. That's awesome. Hmm. Oh, Acellus aquaticus. Aquatic isopods were the first ones I ever kept. That's awesome. I was about 13 years old when I collected some aquatic isopods, not sure of the species, near my home, put them in a tank, and had them breeding. So Bioden, what I'm now doing... I mentioned the yeast that I'm that I use because I feel like I've got a handle on how to use it. I don't really advise it for beginners, but that's what I use. As well as either fish food pellets or aquion algae rounds, cichlid pellets or aquion algae rounds that I add in there for the snails to eat, and they kind of indirectly feed the feed the Daphne in that way. And first class fish, you have springtails, Daphne white worms, and vinegar eels. Awesome. I have. All those, um, I don't have white worms right now, actually. Um, I've cultured grindle worms quite a lot, but I don't have any currently. And uh, I have micro worms as well. So it looks like we're into some of the same things. That's pretty cool. Oh, yeah. Oh, they do. And they, they bring out the activity in the fish. So one thing I'm going to do now, I'm going to add some uh, yeast to the tank here. And I want you to see if you can see what happens to the Daphne. Hopefully it's gonna work this time. It's been working the last few times I've tried it. So here we go. I'm gonna shake up the yeast, make sure it's completely mixed. I put it to soak a while ago, so it should be, but uh, we'll see what we get. Adding that cloud of yeast there, you can, Feed them pretty robustly. I don't know if it's going to show up. We'll see what it does. But um, if my predictions are correct, in a few minutes, they're going to be all balled up near the surface because I put the food in there. They appear to be reacting to the food that way. Oh, I see Sandy's here and Sandy Skinks. Welcome. Plants with Daphnia. I don't do it myself. I know that in natural bodies of water, it's a very common thing. Um, I've heard people do it. I've seen a couple of people do it successfully. I've never had long-term success with it, so I don't do it. But that doesn't mean other people can't and don't do it.
Yeah, you don't necessarily need an air stone in your Daphnia bucket. I think, um, in fact, I don't use air stones at all. I use bubbles without air stones because the air stones are, they often produce bubbles that are too fine. If you can make sure the air stone is producing coarse bubbles, I think you're going to be okay. But any fine bubbles can be a problem. And uh, if you don't have any air movement at all, that's not necessarily a problem. It's just you're not going to get as high uh, yields from that as you would from a colony with moving air. It really makes a difference in the uh, production, but it's not necessarily going to make or break a colony in terms of keeping them alive. Yeah, it looks like they're already starting to ball up near the surface because um, I put the food in. I'm going to adjust the camera just a little bit to see if you can uh, see that. I don't know if that really helps. We can really see what's going on or not. I think that might be worse. It's trying to refocus. Oh, no, you can see it. You can see them balling up, I think, a little bit. It's not great, but you can kind of see it. Um, there's the bug hub. Hello and welcome. Oh, Zero Cool doing a bug page. That's awesome. Oh, okay. You may still have brodifers in there, Therapod Hunter. Um, they can survive quite a few conditions, and in with the newt, it's likely that there's going to be smaller microorganisms that the rotifers can eat. The density may never get to the point that you could use it to feed fish out of, you know, fish uh, larvae or newly, newly free-swimming fry out of your newt tank, maybe, but um, you'll probably still very likely have some surviving. So, oh yeah, we're, we're getting the, the balled up effect here that I can see. Can everybody see that? Let me know if you see it. Seeing the balled up effect of the Daphnia because I fed them. You can see the contrast between that and what we saw before. So McGee, the water is solid green. It doesn't seem to be algae. Um, it might be something else. Uh, let's see. You could have some cyanobacteria, possibly, but solid green depends on the kind of green. Is it sort of an iridescent green? That could be cyanobacteria, but it could just be green water. Um, and you could actually put Daphne in that to clear that up, very likely. So RI naturalist. Yeah, that is that is a good question. If you collect Daphne from a pond or lake, there could be all sorts of other arthropods in there, amphipods, um, insect larvae, hydra, all kinds of things. Generally, my take on that is once you have collected them, you want to move uh, just the Daphne out, use a pipette or something similar to just move a few Daphne out into another enclosure, another container with appropriate water conditions, because then um, you're much more likely to be able to have removed the other critters like with this tank i wanted to set up a tank that did not have any scuds in it at all and so like i said i took two daphnia out put them in a gallon jar let them proliferate for a little while and then move them in it worked perfectly so i, I would recommend that method honestly because they breed so fast that once you got them going you know the first couple of weeks are going to be a little slow but once you get them going i could harvest probably a thousand daphnia from this tank every other day and be fine. Um, so I did, I did read something that said that there was a problem with Daphnia and plants years ago, and I kind of went with that. So I haven't experimented with it. I have been tempted to try things like uh, water lettuce, dwarf water lettuce, which I have tons of. I grow water lettuce in my shrimp and endler tank. I grow water lettuce in my goldfish tank. I have to just take huge handfuls of it out every week or two um, to keep up with it. So it seems like that might be a good option. The only problem is introducing those plants into the tank. You could very well be introducing just one hydra, and that's all it takes because they reproduce asexually. You know what I mean? So... Oh, yeah. 
I've been interested to see how Cheyenne's doing with those too. I, I watched a video where he was talking about those. It sounded really interesting. So McGee, uh, if Sean, I, he may have responded to you, but honestly, you could try putting some Daphne in there. It sounds like you have extra nutrients and or extra light, and you can try modifying those. Um, we also might be an imbalance of nutrients uh, if the plants are not getting something that they need, but the algae is perfectly happy to work without very much of, because um, algae can work with less, then that might be an issue too. Those are the three things I can think of. But if you want to just um, attack it directly, you could put Daphne in there and they would uh, do a pretty good job, likely, uh, at reducing it. And very much to the point where you could see in there, you might have find out then you have to start exporting Daphnia. <laughs> Bio Dan, oh, yep, you're doing the same kind of thing. I haven't worked with black worms at all. Worked with grindles a lot. Not really white worms much. Microworms, definitely. Um, I started microworms about the same time I started Daphne when I was around 13. So great little, great little worms. I actually learned a really cool trick for breeding uh, vinegar eels and doing vinegar eels much more easily. So um, Mm, that might be the thing. The light might be the thing. You might need to reduce it a little bit. Oh, no problem, Bug Hub. Just glad you're here. Okay, so it looks like people are seeing the balled up Daphnia, which I think is pretty cool. Dump in the food, that's what they do, right under the light. It's kind of fun. Um, yeah, Daphnia don't fare well with a type of pump or filter that, uh, like a hang on back filter or power filter or something like that typically because they get sucked up. They're not very good at... Uh, regulating where they swim. They, they certainly are attracted to light, as you can see here, but um, they're not very good about dealing with things that'll, that could suck them up. And so they will tend to get sucked up into a filter and they don't do well with that, as you might imagine. So yeah, you're right. Okay, they're swimming in circles after the water change. Could be a temperature thing, could be a light thing. I see them reacting like that, swimming in circles after uh, light, a change in light, that does happen. Oh, yeah. So, Aftec. Um, aquatic tanks in the house, if I were to count them. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, at least eight, at least eight, nine, at least nine, maybe more. At least nine water tanks in the house. Or aquatic tanks with aquatic organisms in them. Got quite a few. So you have dwarf water lettuce and giant duckweed with yours and seam. Okay, good. Good. That is good to know. Yeah, I'm not a huge fan of duckweed. It is my um, nemesis too. Um, yes, nemesis is, is correct. Um, duck, uh, yeah, I'm not a fan of duckweed. I've eliminated it successfully a few times and never want it again. I always think, oh, duckweed would be so nice. Uh, my goldfish will eat it, blah, blah, blah. And it gets into a tank that doesn't have goldfish in it. And then it's all over the place. And it takes so long to destroy it. So vinegar eel trick. Okay, super cool. I used to breed vinegar eels, the old method. And I was frustrated by how... Um, Harvesting them was a pain, and the quantities you produced were not great. So this is what you do. <clears throat> I, I learned this from the person I bought my latest culture from because I had a culture for years and years and lost that culture. And, you know, that's happened a couple of times. Anyway, um, you basically keep them like you do on microworms. So you use like an oatmeal-based culture, but instead of using water with the... Uh, to cook the oatmeal, you use half apple cider vinegar and half water, like a distilled water, half distilled water, half apple cider vinegar. 
and then maybe you add a little bit of vinegar if it's too if the mixture is too thick put the vinegar oils on that they culture just like microbes they climb up the side of the container use a q-tip scoop them off the side of the container swish them in with your fish boom done super easy game changer for vinegar oils seriously and my guess from what i know about how uh other nematodes can uh, be gut loaded by the food. You know, they've done research. People will say, "Oh, it doesn't matter what you feed your nematodes because they're, you know." No, they've done they've done tests. Um, microworms, which are free living non non parasitic nematode, and vinegar eels, which are free living non parasitic uh, nematode, uh, they've done this the study with microworms. So I'm pretty sure this is true for vinegar eels too. You can add nutrients to their food medium and the nutrients get picked up and significantly um, in significant quantities to be passed on to the fish and the fish drive a nutritional benefit from it. So I'm assuming that being on the oatmeal substrate is good for the vinegar eels and better for the fish. And you can add things like nutritional yeast to that uh, oatmeal matrix, which I do. And so I think you get much better vinegar eels. And I feed those to my handlers. I feed the, um, microworms and the vinegar to my endlers and they they go after it so so particular staphnia strain that you prefer i want to tell you a funny story and it is that once upon a time there were many many strains of cladocerin many different species of cladocerins in the world many many i don't even know how many and hobbyists decided that there were two daphnia pulex the smaller one and daphnia magna the larger one those are two species of daphnia but there are many other species of Daphnia in terms of Cladocerans, meaning Cladocerans is a bigger group. Daphnia is just a genus. And um, many of the ones in the hobby may not even be Pulex or may not be Daphnia at all in the sense that they're not that genus, but they are Cladocerans and related to Daphnia. Like Moina is another group of Cladocerans that look very similar to Daphnia and act a lot like them. But people say, oh, it must be Pulex or it must be Magna, and it's not. I mean, you, you might have one or the other, but you might have something else. So it's kind of funny that people in the hobby in general, or the hobby itself, has decided that there are two species when, in fact, there are many more. So hopefully that helps. So what do I like about Daphnia? One thing I love about them, they're like living lava lamps when you feed them. Check this out. I wish you could see what this looks like in real life. I wish my bandwidth were such that you could see what this really looks like. If you want to get a good idea of what it looks like, though, you can go to my Instagram and I have uh, posted better footage of them that you can see better than this. But uh, yeah, you can't even see them moving now. That's crummy. Oh, well, yeah, you kind of can. But I love that they're living lava lamps. Um, I love that they are such good food for fish. I love that you can culture such huge amounts of them in such a short amount of time with relative ease. They're easy to harvest, easy simplicity itself to harvest, just grab a net and scoop up a bunch. Um, and they are just fun to watch. I love the, the way that if you look at individuals, they're always hopping around and it's funny. And if they're in large groups, you can see them swarming, which is interesting. Um, they're really good for conditioning fish, absolutely fabulous for conditioning fish for breeding. And I used to breed a lot of fish. I still breed, you know, a little bit here and there, but um, I'm breeding blue star endlers all the time but uh and I've, I've bred you know 25 30 different species of fish in my life i guess something like that and they're excellent for that and it's great for me to always have daphne on hand i can always sell them it helps support aquamax pets people buy daphne from me so i ship them all over the country they don't require a permit to ship they're not regulated by aphis so all i have to do is put them in a breather bag um, put some good insulation, good padding in there, and I can ship it all over the country. And then people can either feed them to their fish or start breeding them, culturing them. So those are some things I like about them. So in Sandy Skeet, there's two reasons why they're balling up. One is they're right under the light. But I have noticed that for whatever reason, that when I put food in, the, the balling up under the light becomes immediately much more pronounced. And so I just demonstrated that. A minute ago, I dumped in some some yeast for them to eat, and they balled up more than they were balled up before. I'm not sure why their uh, positive thigmo not thigmotaxis, positive phototaxis, or their attraction to light increases so dramatically right after being fed. But apparently, it does. Something I, I've observed over time. Take a sip of the water. <laughs> you know, they're actually parasites that you can get 
from drinking water with live Daphnia in it. And I don't think these Daphnia carry that parasite because the, um, I think that's mostly a tropical parasite. Uh, so I don't think these Daphnia would ever have carried it, but even if they had, they've been so much removed from their vector cycle that I don't think they would carry that parasite, but there could be other things I could get from drinking this water. So I'm definitely not going to drink it. Um, I kept a few crayfish McGee a long time ago when I was a kid. Um, it's sad, but the um, self-cloning crayfish are illegal in my state. Otherwise, I think they would be so cool. Um, okay, so Brian, um, Daphnia can be introduced into bird baths, and I can explain that in just a minute, how that happens. Um, these tiny white bugs in your bird bath could be other things. It could be cyclops or other copepods. Uh, but it, the vectors for transmissal to your bird bath are pretty much the same. Both Daphnia and um, many copepods can be carried on the mud uh, that adheres to bird legs when they visit a pond or something like that. And then um, they can carry that even if it dries out. They can The eggs are still viable. They can be carried to another body of water, even a bird bath. And the bird's sitting there, the, the mud gets in there, it starts to dissolve and falls in there, and then you've got eggs in there. Um, wind can also carry Daphnia eggs and um, copepod eggs. And since they're parthenogenic, it only requires one egg carried on the wind to start a population. So uh, either of those two uh, could have happened to um, get these critters, these white bugs that you see swimming around. Um, it could be something else too. I'm not going to discount the fact it could be something else. There's a uh, seed shrimp works very similarly. Seed shrimp could also be transmitted on the legs of birds. And it's even more likely that seed shrimp, which are very tiny uh, little water arthropods um, and crustaceans, these seed shrimp uh, could be transmitted on mud on the legs of birds and just as, as adults and survive that. Daphne are much less likely to survive that, but um, the seed shrimp possibly could, as long as the mud's still wet. Um, I have experimented a little bit with scuds controlling duckweed. If you have enough scuds, um, they can eat. They will eat duckweed for sure. Um, I've seen them do it. Um, I'm not sure if they could eliminate a huge infestation or not. It would kind of depend on, you know, it would kind of be a battle of whether the duckweed is going to grow faster, the scuds are going to reproduce and eat it faster. Hard to say. But the, if conditions are right, I, I suspect it could work. Hmm. So oh, mantis cod, that is a great point with the algae bloom. If this is a green water algae bloom, I'm going to mention a trick that people have used with Daphnia. You know those little net breeders that people will put in? They have the fine mesh net, and they put it in uh, for, say, a live bear or some their quarry cats lay eggs or something, and they put that in there so that they can keep the little fry in the tank. They're still getting the flow of the water through the tank um, so that whatever fish are in that little net are benefiting from the the water quality in the main tank, but they're safe from being eaten. Some people have put Daphnia in those net breeders in a tank with green water in it. And then the Daphnia reproduce in that little thing. And as the water flows by, they're just eating that green water. And people have actually eliminated green water issues with that uh, net breeder full of Daphnia, which sounds insane, but it's true. And then you can take out Daphnia and periodically feed them to your fish as well. So so first class fish, let me know if you have specific questions about the eel trick, but basically it's just um, vinegar eels require um, an acidic environment to thrive. And so instead of cooking oatmeal like you would to eat with uh, water, you use half distilled water and half um, apple cider vinegar instead of the water you would use to cook the oatmeal. Once it cools, just put your vinegar else in that. That's what it does. And yes, a biodan, I definitely do the same thing. Um, I have been recommending people do that for years because I've been doing it for years. Spirulina and nutritional yeast and microworm substrate is awesome. It does increase the uh, the nutritional profile, the nutritional value of those microworms. So definitely keep doing that. So McGee. Um, well, you certainly will get a, a dense population of Daphnia and you, uh, 
if you don't harvest them, you may get a crash. It is it is beneficial to harvest them to keep them um, regularly keep them from crashing. Uh, once they get past a certain population, they will tend to crash because they're there's a limit to the uh, you're either not feeding them enough so they start to starve or you're feeding them so much the waste in the water gets too high and then starts to kill them. So one of the other is going to happen unless you harvest them and you also need to you know keep up with the water changes. But um, yeah, they 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 will definitely get to a high population in that tank if you don't feed them off. A larva lamp, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> That's a good one. You don't need to apologize for that. Can you feed the ones to, that die to your isopods? Um, I don't, I've never tried that. I mean, there's not much left of them after they die pretty soon. They, they kind of dis disintegrate pretty quickly. But if you, you could probably do something like that, if you could uh, remove them effectively, I, they'd probably eat it. <laughs> yeah. Daphne Kombucha. What about for critters that don't eat the food, but they eat the mold created by the food, like springtails? Um, on the gut loading. You mean, can you effectively gut load springtails by having them eat the mold that gets on the food that they eat? Okay. Well, um, Brian, if you want to send me a, a close-up video of what they are, I can probably give you a decent idea um, of what they might be. Um, they, My guess is that they're probably not scuds. Those are a little bit more difficult to transport since they are born live and uh, much like isopods from pouches on their mother. Um, not to say it couldn't happen, like it's impossible. It could be some mud on a bird that stayed moist. The pond's not very far away. You know, that, that could happen. But Daphne or sea shrimp or, um, you know, uh, copepods of some kind are the most likely. Mm, I like that mix. Um, I like that mix by Daphne. I would, I would use that. It looks like a great uh, mix for Daphne, for sure. So Zodiac, this is a great question. I've heard it before. I feel like um, shrimp tend to be more sensitive to water quality issues than, than Daphne. But since I haven't tried it, I can't say it's not going to work. I just, I tend to think that um, there's going to be a little bit too much waste in the the water for the shrimp, probably. Um, I've never had a Daphne culture that was thriving that looked uh, pristine. You know, you, a lot of times you want a shrimp tank to look sort of pristine, uh, so you can see the shrimp. You know, you want high visibility and you want uh, the aesthetic quality of the shrimp going on there. If you don't care about that, I mean, you could experiment about it a little bit in that tank and see what you get. But I've never tried. So, um, and Sandy Skink, it would be a good idea to know about these teeny water things just because there are different things that could show up in your water and some of them are beneficial and some of them are, are not. Um, some of them, you know, uh, could help with, uh, could be beneficial for keeping with fish. Some could be beneficial if you want to uh, keep a pond without fish, but you want to reduce algae, you know, things like that. So, yeah, yeah, I would say so. Oh, 
Ho ho. Someday. Someday when I have the space. Yeah. Yeah, this is a cool thing. This I'm glad you brought this up. Um, the thing with Daphne that you can do that in answer to Sean's question about what's good about Daphne, this is this is one of them. If you get the right um, gauges of netting, you can remove the larger ones, like Biodan is suggesting here, leaving the smaller ones in the tank um, to grow up. It only takes a few days for them to grow up and start reproducing. So um, you can, it's a very efficient way to harvest the sizes you want and keep your colony going. You're not going to overfish, so to speak. So first class fish. Um, so basically that's it. Yeah, you have, you use half distilled vinegar, half vinegar, cook oatmeal with that mixture. And then um, for the container, I use like a, a yogurt container with some holes poked in the lid, something like that, because you want to be able to, I don't use a narrow neck container like I sometimes do with for vinegar eels in the old method. Wide container that you can easily reach in and, and harvest those uh, vinegar eels off the sides with that. Uh, cotton swab or something like that. And true, those are my really old, that's the old method of vinegar eel culture. Um, they, they work, but I would prefer this newer method. It's uh, much more efficient in terms of production and harvesting. I've thought about using book lice. I've never had any, but I thought about it for sure. Oh, okay. I think I see what you're saying. Well, springtails will certainly eat a lot of food, um, not just the mold. Um, springtails will directly eat food and they will eat mold. They, they're not super picky, but a lot of times if the food is available and it's moist enough for them to eat, they'll just eat that and not bother with the mold. And so they can help prevent mold by eating what mold would otherwise grow on. But if the mold does come, they will, they will also eat it. So here's the thing you can do, Aftag. That's a great question. And what you can do, um, if you want your Daphne, you want Daphne uh, to reproduce, and you want a single bed of fish, and you don't want to produce too many, just do a jar culture. I actually have a video on culturing Daphne in a jar. If one of you uh, mods would like to throw that up in the um, in the comments, uh, please throw that link up. That'd be awesome. But you can culture them in a half gallon jar, a gallon jar, a couple of quart jars, you know, whatever you want to do. And it's really easy, basically. Um, I explained it in my video, but to give you the nutshell version, um, once you get a culture done going in a jar, and it, I recommend at least a quart jar, um, half a gallon or a gallon is better. Uh, you just feed like a drop or two a day until the culture gets a little bitter, and then it might be three or four drops a day of uh, like a liquid food. And then once a week, you dump off half that water, and you can use, you can pour it through a net to get all the Daphne out of that half you dumped out, feed that to your fish, and then uh, fill it up with uh, appropriate water for the Daphne. That go, that'll go for years. I've kept Daphne cultures going like that for years without any problems. So yeah, um, that's, that's a great way to do that if you just have a single beta. And that's cool, Therapod Hunter. I have never tried it, so I'm glad to know that you have and, it's, and it works. So Nemer Kamal, do you have any written guide about Daphne culture? I have two. Actually, I have one on my website, aquarimax.com. You can go there, and if you do a, a search for Aquarimax Daphnia, you'll, be, you'll see a Daphnia guide that's um, written there. And you can also buy on Amazon the Aquarimax Guide to Seven Easy Live Foods. It's an older book. I wrote it a number of years ago, but it's still valid information, and it's a good way to culture Daphnia. So um, there you go. Uh, two ways you can get to a written guide that I have produced on Daphnia. And yeah, Brian, okay, I'll take a look, uh, I'll keep an eye out for that and uh, hopefully be able to get some colonies going. So Bioden, raising fire brats, cool. I know a lot of people use them to feed to micro geckos. So if you don't have any micro geckos, um, you might try, if you have predatory inverts of various types, you might, might try them. Um, I would be interested in seeing how various invertebrates react to fire brats, things like uh, young mantids or young jumping spiders, young centipedes, 
you know, things like that. I, I'd really be interested in finding out how that goes. Possibly um, amblypidgets too. Maybe maybe amblypidgets would go after firebats. Springtails, uh, yeah, I've seen them eat some of the Repashi products for sure. And awesome. Thank you, First Class Fish, for joining. I'm going to see if I can turn this off. I don't know what's going on there. The phone is far too loud and far too close to this. Okay, so Biodan, um, you are. You got the fire bats for your jumpers, so do they eat them? I'm curious. Well, I guess it is about 6.30. That means it's about time to wrap up. I apologize that the Daphne cam was not as high res as I was hoping. It's actually a little better now that we're getting close to the end. Still not perfect, but you can see that they're doing well. So first class fish, did they did they eat it? Did your Daphnia eat the the dry repashi suspended in the water? I wouldn't be too surprised if they did. Well, I had better head out. I appreciate everybody participating today. Hope you uh, learned something new about Daphnia. And looks like uh, Sean was happy for the Daphnia cam in the aquatic evening. Excellent. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. And I think you're right, and Sandy Skink, although Daphne I like and fungus nuts I'm not a big fan of. But other than that, they are, they are similar. So thank you, everyone. Um, oh, Peter, excellent. Glad that you popped in. Glad to see you here. Um, I wish uh, I could go another hour so we could ch chat some more. But uh, hopefully I'll see you in, a, in another stream soon. Looks like we got a super chat from Mr. and Mrs. Morelia. Thank you so much. Appreciate that as well. And I'm going to take off now. So you all take care and I'll see you uh, soon.